lair here, the number 10 kitchen. Well, very welcome. Boris Johnson repeatedly promised me an interview at Downing Street and eventually ran in to a fridge to hide from me to avoid having to fulfill his, his pledge. Your fridge is over there. Can you at least give me a guarantee that in the next 35 minutes you're not going to run into that fridge? I, I can give you that guarantee, but if you get hungry halfway through, we can go <laughs> raid it for some snacks. It's 100 days today. Uh, two Liz Trusses or 10 lettuces we worked out because the lettuce lasted 10 days, which was longer than your predecessor. Was your first priority, if you're honest, simply survival, given the turmoil of what had happened before? You know, actually, I, I wasn't thinking about politics when Liz resigned at all. I was, uh, I was with my kids having lunch up, uh, up, up north at, in Teesside at TGI Fridays, and we were finishing off lunch and about to head to take them bowling. And I had somewhat moved on after everything that happened over the summer. So my head wasn't completely in that space, if I'm being completely honest. And obviously, she resigned. And you know, I had to think about what to do. And ultimately, I strongly believe in public service and felt out of a sense of duty more than anything else that I should try and come and make a difference, given it was a pretty challenging time. Well, had, it, had it crossed your mind when you lost that leadership race to just get out of politics because it's a you know it's a brutal business. You'd had a go at running yeah. the leadership, it hadn't worked. Had it gone through your mind to just actually try something else? Not not to leave politics, and I'm very devoted to my constituents at home in North Yorkshire and Richmond. So I hadn't considered leaving politics altogether, but I had obviously assumed that my career in frontline politics had come to an end. I mean, this is, and, we're talking four months ago. Yeah, no, that's right? what I said. I my mean, head, this is how my head, insane it's been. Four months my, ago, my, TGI Fridays with your kids, you're thinking, well, I'll never work in, the, in a cabinet again. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was assuming. I now mean, you're in number 10. Yeah. We're in your flat. You're the boss. You're the prime minister. <laughs> It's a little bit. Nice. Yeah, it was. A, look, it was not what I was expecting. I knew when I resigned. When I resigned as chancellor, I said at the time I, that was probably. I, I knew that would be the last. I resigned thinking, and believing that would probably then be the last senior job I had in politics. That's what I thought I was doing, and not to leave politics altogether. But as you said, I didn't expect to be in, in cabinet or serve in a position like this again. Um, so yeah, it came. It, the whole thing came as a pretty big surprise, but. As I said, look, the, the country was in a difficult spot, and you think? Uh, <laughs> I mean, and I thought I could make a difference. It, you said in in 2020, when asked if you were after the top job, God no, definitely <laughs> not. Seeing what the prime minister has to deal with, yeah. and then a year later, you run for that job at a time when the economy is tanking, the party's cratering in the polls. There was a raging war in Europe, the worst cost of living crisis in a lifetime, the remnants of this terrible pandemic, it's pretty much the worst imaginable hospital pass any incoming Prime Minister could ever wish to receive, which begs the question, what on earth did you want to do this for? Yeah, well, thanks for reminding me, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> that long list. And look, you're right, there's no point sugarcoating it, it's not an easy situation. And, you know, I, I, ask, you know, I do ask myself the same question on, uh, on occasion. I, you know, I guess that's what I said before. It's a, I, for me, it's about duty. And actually, there's a concept in Hinduism called dharma, which you know, roughly translates into duty. And you know, it's, that's how I was raised. It was about doing, doing the things that were expected of you and make, trying to do the right thing. And even though it was going to be a nightmare job for all the reasons that you uh, outlined, you know, I felt that I could make a difference, and I was the best person to make a difference at that moment, especially given the challenges that people were facing and what they were seeing with their mortgages. And that's, that's ultimately why I put myself forward to, to do it, and knowing that it would be difficult and challenging, but ultimately doing what I thought was my duty in that situation, because I believed deeply in service and, and thought I could make a difference to the country. When I interviewed Tony Blair when he was Prime Minister here at Downing Street, he had a singing fish on the wall called Billy Bash, Bass, I think it was, uh, that used to sing if you pressed a button, don't worry, be happy. Do you have anything like that? And what is your mantra for the nation <laughs> right now? No, I, uh, I have my wife, but she doesn't sing, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> um, and I mean, and we, actually, we do like Bob Marley, but um, no, look. What's I, the right mantra right now for the public? So many people yeah. are suffering. So many people are worrying. What is your message to them? It's have hope. 
have hope because I can make it better and I will make it better. And that's what I say, and that's what I'm working day and night to do. That's why I put myself forward for this. And that's why at the beginning of the year, I set out for the country, the five things I wanted to do for them, which are quite straightforward in, in one sense. The problem you have, I've seen the and, five pledges, and yeah. we'll discuss those. There's a new poll out today, YouGov, Times, Times Radio, that says pretty much on almost every metric that three quarters of the public do not think you're delivering on any of the things you're now pledging to fix. Three quarters don't think you're going to be prime minister after the next election. These are you know, pretty heavy stats against you. You haven't got that much time to turn this yeah. around. You've got 500 days or so maximum. Can you do it? Have you got enough time to implement these changes and actually see change be affected? Yes, I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And I'm giving absolutely everything I've got. And of course, people might not feel that today. And for all the reasons that you, you set out earlier, the situation is tough. But I want people to have confidence that it will get better. So if you, you know, go through those things I said, halve inflation. Yes, I believe by the end of the year we can halve inflation. Grow the economy. Yes, I do believe over the course of this year we'll get the economy growing again. Reduce debt. We've already made some difficult decisions to, to ensure that that happens, but we've got to stick to the path. And then cutting waiting lists. I was just in a hospital earlier this week talking about our plans to bring down waiting times in the NHS, which I know we can deliver on. We're working with the NHS to do that. And stopping the boats and tackling illegal migration. That's probably the trickiest of all of them. But again, it's something that I care very deeply Please about. And, and I t by the end of the year, when hopefully we can come back and do this again, and you can give me my report card on those mm. five things, uh, I, I am confident that we will have delivered on them. And the country at that point will be able to say, hang on, this guy said he was going to do these things. And he's done them. And that's what I want to be judged by. Because I think politicians say lots of things, and the country's probably quite frankly well, sick say, and tired of it, right? I, I but think, what they want is someone to yeah. just do the things that they say, and that's what I'm going to do. Political words are cheap, right? Yeah. I mean, anyone can sit as prime minister and, and say to me, I'm going to fix everything. The proof will be literally yeah. in the pudding, yeah. right? And I will set you up on that. I will come back. Yeah. Because people want to see actual delivery. They do. I, I believe that. And that's why, you know, actually, I get you talk about those five things and all that polling. Other people say, oh, gosh, that's not ambitious enough at all. And where's the grand vision and all the rest of it? And what I'd say to them is these are the things that matter most to the country. Do you have a doctrine? I mean, people are struggling to see what your what, what is Sunakism? What is the doctrine you have for leadership of this country? Well, first of all, it's about making sure that people can feel proud of the UK proud of our country and that they have peace of mind that things are going to be better for their children and grandchildren. Now, that's what I'm driven to deliver. And right now, what does that mean? It means delivering on those five things, because that's how we're going to do that. That's how we're going to make sure people do have peace of mind, that things will be better for their children, for their grandchildren. That is how we will make sure people feel proud of our country. And that's why those five things are the most important things to focus on. How would you assess your first 100 days? Yeah, I'm. Well, <laughs> as you said, like I came in and it was a challenging situation, but I'm proud of what we've achieved. I'm proud. And what have you achieved? If you, if you look at some of the things that we've done in that relatively short space of time, first and most importantly is taking action to stabilise the economy. And you, you mentioned it earlier about the situation that the country faced in the autumn last year. And it was, it was pretty stark, right? People were absolutely terrified about what was going to happen to their mortgages, what was going on. And we came in, I came in, and we took pretty decisive action in the autumn statement last year to put in place an economic plan that brought borrowing into under control, calmed the markets down, made sure that the increase in interest rates is, is going to be far less than people had feared. And that's going to make an enormous difference to millions of people's lives. People would say, all right, yes, the, the pound dollar rate, for example, is back up to yeah. a much higher level and so on. There's merit to what you've just said. But they would say, for example, your pledge about the boats, the small boats yeah. coming over, they'd say, the, not only have you not delivered, this situation is, just seems to be getting worse all the time. And one of the key things that Brexit was supposed to be, yeah. getting control of our borders, it seems to be completely out of control. What are you actually going to do yeah. about that, for example? Yeah, so let, we'll take a step back. First of all, why is that? Why is that issue important to me? Because it, it is, and it's a thing I've spent an enormous amount of time on. Because ultimately, for me, it comes down to fairness. 
and fairness really matters to me. And I don't think the current situation is fair. Right? People coming here illegally, it's not fair on those who are working hard, paying taxes, relying on public services. It's not fair on those who migrate here legally and follow all the rules. And it's actually not fair on those who desperately need our help from around the world, and we're not in a position to be able to help them because of what's happening. So for all those reasons, we, we need to fix this. And for me, you know, what, what I hear when someone says, well, you know, if someone comes here and claims asylum illegally, they've come here illegally and they claim an asylum, I hear that and say, that's wrong, right? When I hear that someone has paid thousands of pounds to come here and exploit our world-leading modern slavery laws, that's wrong. Or when I hear that someone's trying to, you know, game the system, whether it's human rights or exploit our compassion and frustrate their removal to a safe place like Albania or Rwanda, that's wrong. So we have to fix all those things. The system that we need, the system that I want to introduce is one whereby if you come here illegally, you should be swiftly detained, and then in a matter of days or weeks, we will hear your claim, not months and years, and then we will safely remove you somewhere else. And if we do that, that's how we'll break the cycle. Because if all these smugglers but and gangs, keep... if they see that that happens... I understand. Yeah, but they, but I've so... heard, I have heard this a lot, Prime yeah. Minister. So, let's, so, so what, my so question for you is, yeah, so what are we doing? What are you tangibly yeah. going to, to do, do to enforce this yeah. and make it happen? So, look, in the first 100 days, what have we done? What have I done? A, I've got a new deal with France, which is increasing the amount of patrols that are happening on French beaches, which is making a difference already. Secondly, I've got a brand new deal with Albania. Albania accounted for a 30% of all the it's illegal ridiculous. migrants. Of course that's ridiculous. But I've worked with the Albanians to put in place a new deal, which means for people coming from Albania illegally, we will be able to remove them safely back to Albania. And that is already happening. We're putting illegal migrants from Albania back on flights, and that will ratchet up over the year. And that's tangible improvement in the situation. That deal is a new deal. And then we're wholesale changing how our asylum system works in the UK to make sure that we process things far quicker and more efficiently. We've got more enforcement of people who are working illegally. But the key thing we need to do is introduce new laws. And very soon we'll be introducing new laws into Parliament which deliver the system that I explained. The system which says if you come here illegally you're not really going to be able to stay here. Give me the simple explanation of what this new law will look like. So what that law will say is if you come here illegally, if you're an illegal migrant here, then you will not be able to stay here. And in fact, we will be able to detain you. And then we will hear your claim in a matter of days or weeks, not months or years, and we will have the ability, in the vast majority of cases, to send you to an alternative safe country. Be that be where you've come from, if it's safe, like Albania or indeed Rwanda. That is the system. Is Rwanda that ever going to happen? Yes, I mean, we're working our way through the courts with that. And of course, there are going to be people who try and frustrate this. But that is a system that I think the vast majority of people watching will say, that sounds reasonable. How do you couple it with humanity? How do you work out who are yeah. genuine asylum seekers, who, do, who actually want our help because they're desperate, yeah. perhaps from a war-torn country, yeah. from a war that we were involved in? So there's a couple of things. A, you're absolutely right that that... That is the bit that we have to get right, because we're always going to be a compassionate country. It's something that we're all very proud of. And that's why drafting the law is, is not straightforward, and we're taking the time to get it absolutely right so that we can capture those genuine cases, which, of course, we want to. But the other thing is this. As we've demonstrated over the past year or two, when we need to open up our hearts and our homes in this country to those fleeing persecution, whether it's uh, Afghanistan, Syria, Hong Kong, Ukraine, we do. And that's what being British is all about. But it needs to be done on our terms. So what I think, actually, is once we've got a grip of the system and we've largely stopped the flow of illegal migrants, we can have a much more sensible conversation as a country in saying, well, who do we want to take? From where and how many? What's our ability to, to help these people? And actually have that conversation proactively and work with the Red Cross and the UN and others to do that. But first, we've got to stop the illegal migration. Have you told your Home Secretary to dial down her rhetoric, which many people think has been overly inflammatory and degrading in some cases about migrants? Well, I think, look, people are frustrated with this situation. I'm frustrated with this situation. But the right way to deal with it is to do the things that I'm saying. And that's required some hard work to get... But on language specifically? Well, on language, look, we should always remember that we're a compassionate country. Right? And we've dememonstrated that, as I said, with Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Afghanistan, Syria, Ukraine. We're a compassionate country. Have you reminded That's, your Home Secretary of that? Uh, she believes that. Everyone believes that in the mm -hmm. government. And we've demonstrated that as a country. Those are our values. But we're not a soft touch. 
right? We are not a soft touch. We believe in playing by the rules. We believe in fairness as well. That is also equally British, and we need a system that delivers that, and that's the bit that we're going to fix. We talk about fairness. A lot of strikes going on at the yeah. moment. You're being very resolute as things stand in standing up to the unions. It's not proving very popular with the public. Again, three quarters think the unions have got the edge yeah. in this at the moment. I want to talk specifically about nurses, mainly because your father was an NHS GP, your mother ran the family pharmacy. You're a person who grew up around the health system, around healthcare. It must burn in your soul. Nurses, we were told to go out and applaud every Thursday mm. in the pandemic. Many of them died in the pandemic, risking their lives to save people's lives. They, to me, should be made an exception, and yet you barely negotiated with the nursing unions. Do you not feel this duty that you talked about to actually take care of nurses and say, actually, we do have to make some exceptions, and at top of my list, my priority is going to be nurses, and give them a proper pay rise. You know, you're, you're right, nurses should be an exception. And that's because they do an incredible job for all of us and they demonstrated that during the pandemic and I'm really grateful to them for that. And you're right, I grew up in an NHS family so this does burn deeply inside of me because I know how important great healthcare is for people and including my own family. And we did treat them as an exception. You know, people forget that actually during, during COVID when I was chancellor, we instituted a public sector pay freeze because actually wages for most people were, were going down. And what we decided in that context, given everything going on, that there should be a pay freeze across the entire public sector. So everyone working in the public sector didn't see their wages rise during COVID, given the economic situation. But you know what? There was one exception to all of that. It was people working in the NHS. Yeah, but it's it all was nurses. I know, but it's, right. all, be, it's so, all been completely dwarfed, as you know, by inflation. But hang on, no, but your, your principle, though, that... Yes. We, that we should treat no, I, is one that I agree with, and it's one that I've actually delivered when I was Chancellor. So I think. Well, are you going to deliver again now? You're Prime so, Minister. And now, when we're talking about this, and I'm really glad actually that to have an opportunity to talk about it. Now, look, it's not always easy in this job because I'm focused on doing what I believe is right for the country mm. and in the long term, and often that means doing things that maybe not always popular, and this is a good example of that. But let me explain why we're doing what we're doing and why I think it's important. Look, I would love, right? I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Who wouldn't? Certainly would make my life easier, wouldn't it, right? Uh, of course I would love to do well, that give, if I give could. Give them one then. So why is that tough, right? Why is it tough? It's, it's about choices. So right now, there's a record amount of money going into the NHS, record amount. And in spite of those difficult decisions that we had to make to stabilise the economy, which uh, were the right decisions, we found more money for the NHS and social care, because I believe that was the right thing to do. So right now, money going to the NHS, biggest it's ever been. But we have to put that in lots of different places. We need to hire more doctors, more nurses. Mm -hmm. We need more scanning equipment but so we do, can detect cancers yes, early. We need more ambulances, so we're doing all of that. I understand, but to so, do that, to, to recruit people, you've got to make them think there's an environment that's worth working in, that they're going to be actually treated in the way that we treated them in the pandemic with yeah. all our applauding. I mean, one specific thing I really got my goat about the nurses is in the pandemic, after a campaign which I led, actually, car park charges were removed from all hospitals for nurses. Right, because they were paying up to £1,000 each a year to park their car outside a place they were going in to save lives. It seemed to me preposterous. In Scotland and Wales, they don't have that charge. But now the pandemic's over, that's come back, and they're now facing charges again of £1,000 a year. You can't think that's right. Surely the nurses in England have to pay £1,000 a year for the privilege of parking outside a hospital to save lives. So actually what we've done is put in place support for trust to be able to support their staff. Why don't you just say enough? Well, you should say, all, And just so, continue what happened in the pandemic. Yeah. Well, because there's other things that we've done for nurses as well. Because you're right, it's not just about pay, there's lots of other ways. You know that's not fair, don't well, you? Well, there's other ways that we can demonstrate yeah, but that's not, our On gratitude. that point, though, it's not fair, is it? Well, look, I, everyone watching this show will get to work in lots of different ways. I know. Right? And, I know. But and, not many are actually going to actually save lives and they're paying £1,000 on average for the pleasure of parking outside a hospital. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and that's why we've put measures in place, actually, and more funding to ease the burden of hospital car parking charges. Actually, not, got, not just on actually, employees, but also on patients but who are there on a regular yes, basis. But actually what's happened is a lot of these trusts have actually put the prices up 
are now paying more for nursing staff than they were before the pandemic. Again, I simply say to you, that's not fair, is it? It's not right. Well, here are some of the other things we're doing, right? Because, again, no, this is all... the, well, no, 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 well, Don't change the subject. On no, that, no. it's not fair and right, is it? Well, let me tell you some of the other things we're doing. I know you and don't then, think it is. Well, look, I, of course, would I, would I love it if people had to pay less to get to work? Of course I would, right? And, of course, I'd love that for everybody. Why are nurses in Scotland and Wales valued more? That's, why that, why, that, why that, don't that, they have to pay to park? Well, that's, that's, that's not quite fair. That's it's not true. quite fair. What, the, the nurses were also... They don't have to pay for nurses parking. Nurses were also on strike in Wales. They don't right. have to pay for parking. They also pay higher taxes. A typical mm. nurse in Scotland pays will higher taxes least, than they will do you at in England. Le, le, right? Will, you, but, at so, but will then, you at least look at that? I, of, of course I'm happy to look at that. Right? Of course I think I'm you happy, should. I think it's a big deal that. for a lot of these but nurses. Look, but this is really important. So look, here are some of the other things that we've done, mm. and then I want to get onto the point on pay. But So you're right, because there's lots of other ways we can value people. We've reinstituted mm. nurses' bursaries. So if you're training to be a nurse, £5,000 a year bursary. Mm -hmm. That's not available for people studying other subjects. That's because we care about nurses in particular. You ask, they should be treated differently. They are. That's very generous. Something else the union asked us for a uh, year before last was when nurses qualify, we want to keep supporting because they want to keep learning new skills so they can help more patients. We said, great, we'll support that. Thousand pounds of a training budget for every newly qualified. Well, but here's nurse. the problem. With, so let's get on to pay, though. So I just want to say here's that we the problem. Are here's what you're not mentioning things. in this context, yeah. which is raging inflation, right. means that all this stuff has been completely dwarfed. Yeah. So you know as well as I do that nurses are actually out of pocket, despite all this, they're massively out of pocket because of inflation. And I think that if a, if a country is told to go out and applaud these people every Thursday for risking their lives in a pandemic, and our reward is to kick him in the teeth the moment it's over, I don't think it's fair. So. I don't think that's a fair characterisation of it. Mm. I don't think that's a fair characterisation of it at all. Right? But look, this is really important. So give me a second to explain. Give me a second to explain. So nurses are getting a pay rise. They're getting a pay rise of about 5% mm. and much higher, actually, for lower paid nurses. So that is happening. Mm. Right? And, and it goes back to the question of there are all these other things that we need to do in the NHS as well. We need more nurses. We need more ambulances. Been... We need more scanners. No, no, no. Okay. But this is, the, the other thing is about... So, look, I don't think anyone watching this show, or you as well, mm. would say, OK, great we need to put up everyone's taxes to pay mm. for that because the money has to come from somewhere, mm. doesn't it? Right? I don't think that's what everyone is saying. Mm. The other thing is, you're right, the thing that is making life difficult for nurses and for everyone else is inflation. Mm. It's the bills that are going up and up mm. and up. We've got to tackle inflation. That's why it's the first of yeah. my five priorities. And unfortunately, in a situation where you've got high inflation, if lots and lots of people get very large pay settlements, mm. it makes the inflation problem worse and last longer, and that is not going to help anybody, okay. including nurses. And that's why, okay. even if it's not popular, it's the right thing for the country to I stay hear. the course. I hear you. You pledged to clean up British politics and rebuild trust through integrity and accountability, but you appointed Suella Braverman as Home Secretary six days after she quit over security breaches, appointed Gavin Williamson to your cabinet despite him being fired twice before by your predecessors, then you had to get rid of him almost immediately over a bullying scandal. You just had to fire your party chairman, Nadim Zahawi, over a tax scandal. And your deputy prime minister, Dominic Raab, is facing serious mass bullying allegations. That's just in four months, prime minister. People are saying, what is going on here? How does this live up to trust through integrity and accountability? It just looks like more of the same. Well, actually, people can judge me on how I've dealt with these situations as they've arisen, right? And in most cases that you, you mentioned, you're talking about things that happened a before I was prime minister. Mm -hmm. But as they've arisen on my watch, I've actually worked in a way that I believe to be professional, in a way that I believe does restore integrity back into the process. Are you comfortable about Dominic Raab staying in his job at the moment and not being suspended pending resolution of this investigation? Yes, because I believe in due process. I believe people should have a fair hearing. And that's why we have an independent advisor. And I think, as people saw at the weekend, that independent advisor, who I'd asked to look into the Nadine Zahawi situation, looked at it quickly, didn't pull any punches mm -hmm. when he wrote his report. And immediately after I received that report, I acted decisively to remove Nadine Zahawi from government because there had been a serious breach in the ministerial code. He, he had to go over tax. A lot of people have asked questions about your wealth. You know that. You're a very wealthy man. I don't hold that against you. You've been very successful in business. You've said that you'll release your tax returns, but we haven't seen them yet. When are you going to do that, and how far back are you going to go? I mean, would it not be 
if you're going to be transparent about this, go back to when you first became an MP and say, right, here you are, here's eight years of my tax returns. So I, I, I will be transparent. They will go back. They generally, in the, there's a precedent for these things. So mm. from one would assume for all MPs, we don't tend to do that. This is something that we restrict. No, but you want to be transparent. Have been, have been prime ministers or, or chancellors mm. or, or mayors in the past. They will be published shortly. The tax, de as you know, the tax filing deadline was just a few days ago. Mm. So that's why. So we've the tax filing deadline's just passed. So they're just being prepared and they will be Really Can you answer one specific about it? Hmm. A lot of people have been suggesting that you may have benefited some way financially from pharmaceutical companies during the pandemic, either through a blind trust or otherwise. Can you clear that up? Have you made any personal financial gain from pharmaceutical companies and in particular from Moderna, who of course made a lot of money from the vaccine? So all my disclosures are done through the Cabinet Office and what you'll see if you read the, the, the statement that they put out is that the, my investments are in a, what's called a blind management arrangement, mm. so I don't actually have any knowledge of what is in there. And that's how that works. So you could have made money. I, 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 I'm not. The whole point about something that's truly blind is that it's blind from me. Do you so. think it's right that a prime minister should have blind trust? I, I think that's better than them having control over them, clearly. That is the long-established mm. process for how these things work. Because the point is, if they're blind, I'm not able to direct or control what's going but on. But we will see no the returns soon. Of it. The tax returns, yes, you will see them okay. soon. Yeah, I committed to doing it and, I, and they will be done. But, the, you know, we just finished the tax filing deadline at the end of January, so they just need to be then prepared and they'll be released soon. Ukraine. Boris Johnson, mm. one of your two uh, recent predecessors, has been on manoeuvres around the world, meeting President Zelensky, meeting Senate leaders in America, almost acting like he's still Prime Minister. Uh, Nadine Doris has interviewed him for Talk TV for tomorrow night, in which she says that you're a submarine Prime Minister. Is it time to put the periscope up and unleash a little torpedo to remind Boris who the actual <laughs> Prime Minister is. No, look, it's, you know, it's great that we've got former Prime Ministers, and I speak to all, you know, all our former leaders, actually. But should he be doing what he's doing? I think all, all of our leaders have a way of continuing to contribute to public life, and that's, that's a good thing. Mm. That's not a bad thing, actually. They've got experience that they want to share. You have no problem with what Boris is doing? No, gosh, I, like, it's, as I say, look, we've, we've got a long list of previous Prime Ministers, and the fact that they still want to contribute but he's to all public over, life... Like, is, example, he's, all, he's all over American television saying we need to send jets to Ukraine. So on, on Ukraine in, in particular, actually, when you talk about what else we've done in the 100 days, mm. that's one of the other things things that I'm proud that I've been able to achieve, and that is to shift our strategy on Ukraine as Prime Minister to a more proactive strategy. Will you send jets? And so, look, we, we are always talking to the Ukrainians about the right support. But they want need. jets. Boris Johnson we, says he should send jets. So, we, we, your we, defence so, minister says he's not going to rule it out. You're the prime minister. No. It's going to be your call. Yes. So the, Should the, we send jets? So the issue is, what is the support that we can provide that we think will make the most difference? And that's why a decision I took as prime minister to, was to be one of the first countries in the world to provide heavy tanks to Ukraine. Mm. And we That's were true. Then, we were then followed by other countries. But I'm like just America, talking specifically like about jets. Yes, but as I said, we, we, we are always in a you dialogue. You don't rule that out. No, we're always in a dialogue with our Ukrainian friends about what the right way to support them is. The thing to bear in mind with jets, though, remember, these are incredibly sophisticated uh, pieces of equipment that require months, if not years, for people to be trained on. But you, don't, but you don't rule anything out. It, it, our, our, our desire and goal is for Ukraine to win this conflict. And to give them what they need to and, do that. And we want to make sure that... It's not about giving them necessarily... Mm. Just giving them what they need. We need to make sure that they can use what they are given. Mm. And that's actually with, with tanks. People saying, well, why am I not seeing them tomorrow? It's because we also need to make sure that they're trained to use the tanks. And that work is ongoing at the moment. So it's not just the equipment. It's also the capabilities and the training that come alongside that. OK. Together with a plan, with our allies, that will ensure that they can be victorious. And that's the strategy that I've shifted as Prime Minister. And it's something I'm proud we've done in 100 okay. days. And we I know something that President Zelensky and the Ukrainians are deeply grateful to us for. OK, we share a love of cricket. And I would say, and I don't mean this as an insult, Prime Minister, but when it comes to your wife, you're, you're batting above your average. <laughs> would you agree? Yes, 100%. Uh, Akshata, now, you said in The Times, and I wasn't sure where this interview got you into trouble, but you oh, said gosh, that yes. you're tidy, she's messy, yes. you're organised, she's not, yeah. you're teetotal, she likes a drink. Was the opposites attract? Uh, well, that you'd have to ask her. Um, but yes, I definitely am batting above my average, mm. and I did get in a lot of trouble for that interview. So I should just uh, reassert that I, I did. It. Those things were taken, I think, a little bit in a more extreme way than I meant them. Are you apparently you like rom coms? I do. Yes, I love actually, not like kind of thing. All that kind of thing. So are you a romantic guy? 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to think so. You're probably better off to ask her rather than was me. Your, was your proposal romantic? Uh, I, I, I think so. <laughs> she said yes, so it had the desired Wait, effect. Can we have a bit of...? Uh, we, yes, we got engaged in a place called Half Moon Bay. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a place that when we were students, we met when we were studying together in the States. And we used to walk in this area and look up at this nice fancy hotel that we never could stay in. And then I surprised her and we did go and stay there. But before that, we went for a walk along the cliffs and we were alone. And that's why I proposed. Ben didn't he? Of course. Really? Yes. You are a little romantic. Yes. Well, what, I, do, what does <laughs> love mean to you? Love? What does love mean? Well, I mean, it... I mean, there's there's lots of different aspects to it, and the, the bit that is the bit that I'm probably most uh, focused on at the moment, and the bit that means the most to me at the moment is the support that she gives me doing this job. And well, know, they say behind every great man is a is a greater woman. Yeah, I mean, in my case, that is definitely true, and it has been particularly true over the past couple of months and the past couple of years. I wouldn't be able to do this job without her. Her love and support, as you said. You said, what's your mantra or how do you, what's my equivalent of the singing fish mm. uh, doing Bob Marley? It, it touched her, right? And that's, that's what I get every day that gives me the extra support to keep going when things are tough. That comes from her. So that's you were very, the you were very love at the moment. You were very supportive of women in the Commons yesterday uh, in relation to Rosie mm. Duffield and the problem yeah. she's had with Keir Starmer. The world's most controversial question, bizarrely, has become, what is a woman? We know that Nicola Sturgeon can't answer that. We know Keir Starmer can't answer that. You're the British Prime Minister. What is a woman? Yeah, I, of course I know what a woman is, adult human female. And what you're actually, though, asking when you ask that question is, I, I think, you know, what's my approach and view about how we as a society grapple with a situation where people are questioning and wanting to change their gender, their identity? Well, we've just had this shocking case yeah. in Scotland where a, a male rapist who raped two women before he comes to trial suddenly decides to transition to be supposedly a woman. He gets convicted yeah. as a woman and then gets sent, first of all, to a woman's prison where there will be other women for him to attack. And his ex-wife says, well, this is ridiculous. He's just doing this because he wants the soft option of being in a women's prison. He's now been sent back to a male prison and therefore, we have to assume it's now being categorised as male. But this shows the problem uh, it, of limitless gender self-identity. This is where it takes us. I, I completely agree. It absolutely does show some of the challenges with this. I mean, look, first of all, we, we must and should have enormous compassion and tolerance and understanding for those who are questioning their gender and identity and wanting to change. And we will always be supportive of that. Of course we will. And it's right to be compassionate about that. That's who we are as a people. But we have to recognise the challenges that that poses, particularly for women's safety, as we've just when been you discussing. See in when and you that's see why biological sex really matters in Yeah, in I mean, it, it, to me, it's, it's immutable. That's what it is. It's biological sex. When you see what's happening in sport, where you see trans yeah. women athletes demolishing women... Yeah female athletes, what do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I think that doesn't strike most people as being fair, right? So, and, and so that's why when it comes to these questions, biological sex matters. Now that you know, we can and will have compassion and tolerance and understanding for everybody who is thinking about transitioning and changing their identity and gender. But you know, for me, when it comes to whether it's sex, whether it's women's mm. spaces, whether it's prisons, biological sex really matters. And actually, we, we saw that recently with what's going on in Scotland, mm. and that's why I took... Again, you say, what else have you done in 100 days and what's bold? You know, we took action that hasn't been I thought been you were completely before, right. Because, you know, the, the, the bill that was passed in Scotland, I think, has real implications for the mm. how we think about these issues on a UK-wide yes. basis and the interaction between these things. I think, so, I think on this safety. you're completely right. I'm glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you've said what a woman is, because a lot of people will be thinking, why can't we say what it I is know, anymore? I, I mean, yes. <laughs> and look, I, I'm, I'm married to one, I have two daughters, and... It, it's really important that they grow up in a society where, where their needs are, are respected, whether it's you know, how they want to be treated when they're in changing rooms or sports, but also their safety. And the other thing I've spoken about is you know, women walking around in the mm. evenings should and deserve to feel safe. Yes. And they should be and deserve to feel safe. And we haven't done a good enough job of that in the past, and we're working really hard to improve things, but it's something that I hope I can achieve as Prime Minister, that, that women do feel that, because that's what we all owe them. What's the biggest frustration for you about how people view you? A lot of people think you're a bit of a nerd. You know, you're a Goldman Sachs guy. You've been high flyer all your life. You're a bit of a geek. 
I, I don't think you are, from what I've been told by people who know you well. <laughs> You know, apparently you, you wrap to ice ice baby by vanilla ice, is that true? Uh, that, that is true, yes. We will not keep, do that now, but and you yes. Keep, and you keep Star Wars lightsabers? I, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Do you yes. keep them in Downing's room? Uh, I don't know if we have one actually down in the kids' room. We might, but yes, I'm a big Star what, Wars what, fan. What Star force Wars do you feel is with you? Uh, well, I hope the force is with me. Yeah, you need <laughs> what, it in what this is job. The, what is the force? What is the force? I never Are you not Star a Star Wars, Wars fan? Never, I hate it. Oh, God, we haven't got time for that in this interview. We'll have a whole separate <laughs> Star Wars interview. Have you not watched any Star no, Wars? No, no. OK, fine. Well, when we're watching some football... I think together, when we're watching our football match together, we'll talk Star Wars on the side. I think grown men running around waving lightsabers is ridiculous. Well, I, I, have, I have children, so I get permission to play Star Wars, Lego and lightsabers. Are you still a Coke addict? Uh, yes, yeah. But really? down one a week. One a week? One a week. So, I've, I mean, I'm restrained. But a proper Coke, not a diet one. And I have this special thing for a particular type of Coke, which is in the fridge somewhere. And you're a Peloton guy? I am. I am yeah. too, but you, you go with Cody, right? I do, I'm yeah. an Olivia Oh, really? Fan. Yeah. Okay, I'll try that. <laughs> <laughs> I, Cody's good. That's another way. You get, it cheers you up, gets you going. So I've, got to, I've got to wrap this up for a bit. But you, no, you were asking actually about that. About that, your character thing. and what yeah, people no, think of you. Yeah, no, about that geek thing. And I, and I was, I mean, I, as you said it, I was reflecting on it. Look, what does that mean? You know, to me, what, look, if that means somebody who is getting up early, who's working hard, who's on top of things, who's trying to actually solve problems and be diligent about that and throw themselves at mm -hmm. it and give absolutely everything that they've got day and night to try and do it, then sure, that is who I am. I'm not going to run away from that. And I, quite frankly, I think that's what the Prime Minister should be. Yeah. I think that's what the country deserves. And we've got some challenges and we're not going to solve them unless the person doing this job is like that, in my view. So I have yeah. one concern about this. You don't drink. You just hate the taste of alcohol, right? Yes. You've never smoked. No. Never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Right? Well, it's a matter of degree. I think most people would consider that I am, I'm financially fortunate, yes. And you got a degree from a US university. And a British one as well. Right. But my point about the first five things I said is yeah. that the only other world leader I've interviewed who ticked all those same boxes was Donald Trump. Should we be concerned, Prime Minister? <laughs> is this a trait that we should be worried Gosh, about? Gosh, I, uh, I think of all the people people would have compared me to, that is not one that I would have <laughs> imagined. Um, but look, look on, on those things, I guess, you know, so what are, what are people, you know, am I frustrated and all the rest of it? Look, I think what people need to understand is what my values are. I think that's the most important. What thing. are they? And that's how I was brought up, right? And I was brought up by... You know, parents who emigrated to this country and they came with an immigrant mindset whereby what they were focused on was working as humanly hard as possible and sacrificing everything so that their kids could have a better future and that we could fit in and integrate into British life well. And that's what I was raised. I was raised to work incredibly hard, to do the right thing, to look after people who are less fortunate than yourselves because that's what my parents we're doing and those are the values that I bring to this job now yes am I financially lucky today I am yeah I, I'm, 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 I'm that is as a result of all the How rich are you? It, I mean by most most people would consider that I am very is it, I mean in, in the spirit of transparency can you give I us a number? I don't think, I don't think we <laughs> no. are, you, are you a billionaire no I'm not going to get into that no I'm not, but the point that you know what does does that what matters about that is is not right how much is in my bank account what matters are my values and what matters are the actions i take for the country mm -hmm. and you know what i had the same bank account when i was chancellor so when i stood up in that first press conference when no one knew who i was and i talked about what we were going to do and i talked about furlough right no one asked me then oh well, how much money is in your bank account right no one cared right so if it didn't matter then it shouldn't matter mm -hmm. now but the first tax cut i ever did as chancellor was a tax cut for the lowest paid it was those on universal credit because I wanted to make it easier for people who were moving off welfare and wanted to move into a job. I wanted them to be able to keep more of their money because I thought that was a really good thing. I believe really strongly in hard work. I think hard work is something that we should reward. How much I, is a pint of milk? 90p. But you know what? Oh, that's good. Uh, do you know what? That, that, when people ask me that question, do you know what I instinctively think of? I think of the price of milk that my farmers get. Because I represent a very rural constituency in North Yorkshire. My neighbour is a dairy farmer. And when I first became an MP, the dairy industry was in a really tough way. You used to get farmers in my patch who were getting paid 20 pence a litre wholesale mm. for their milk. And right now, they were going to get a record high. It's about 50 pence a litre. So I don't get too many complaints from my dairy farmers in Yorkshire about milk prices. So that's what I think of. And that's the other thing that made a big impact on me. A big thing that impacted my life was being a member of parliament for a 
an amazing part of the country. It changed who I am. It's rural. It's in the north. It's where we've made a home and people have welcomed us. And you know, again, I bring those values to this job too. I want to end with three yes or no's. Right. right. And then that's it. You'll, then you're out of this. Right. First one, should King Charles invite Meghan and Harry to the coronation? You're going to be there. <laughs> I had a feeling you might ask me that. So, look, you, you, know, you know I can't talk about the royal family. But what I can say is one of the great privileges of this job is spending time with the monarch and also championing what is an amazing British institution should people all around keep, the world. Should people who keep trashing the royal family and monarchy just shut up? Look, I, I said it's one of the proudest parts of my job is to go around the world and champion and celebrate British institutions like the royal family. Australians have just taken all the royals off their stamps. Yeah, but you know what? There's an enormous amount of affection for the royal family everywhere I go around the world, and they do an incredible job. King Charles does an incredible job. We're, we're lucky to have him. The coronation is going to be superb, and we're going to have a great time. And you don't mind if you're next to Meghan and Harry? I, again, <laughs> what I'm focused on to make sure we have a great time as a country, and that is what I'm confident is going to happen. Are we going to win the Ashes, England? Yes. Are Arsenal going to win the league? Yes. Are Southampton going to get relegated? No. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, well, actually, if you could spare us the points when we play you, that would be, uh, that would be okay. Actually, that's one of the, it's one of the, actually, you say, where do you get your motivation from? So growing up and being a Southampton fan in the 90s, as my formative teenage years, we stayed up most seasons on the last game of the season, one time on goal difference, which we call the great escape. Mm. So I'm quite comfortable with things being tough. But you know what, in the end, you can pull it out of the bag. And that's a little bit like this job at the moment. Things are tough, but I'm confident that they'll get better and we'll be successful. Listen, you've got one of the toughest jobs I can imagine. I've interviewed many British prime ministers over the years. It, this is a really tough job you're in. But I like the ambition you have. And I like the fact you're prepared for me to come back at the end of the year and yeah. see how you get on and be judged on performance. Because I think what the British public want right now is action and results and less of the chat, even though we've just had a good chat. We have had a good chat. We didn't need to raid the fridge, which is a good thing. And you haven't run into it. And I haven't run into it. And we will go celebrate with a Coke afterwards. But it's been great to spend <laughs> some time with you. And, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that is what the country wants. And my job is to deliver for them. And if I don't do it, then fair enough, right? Then I don't, I don't deserve to have people support me. But I'm confident I can deliver for people. And at the end of the year, we can go through that checklist and we can sit and say, well, how have you done? And I look forward to that conversation. Prime Minister, I wish you all the best. I want you to succeed. Thank I, think, you, I think most people would like you to succeed. We've had enough chaos, enough failings. We need this country back on its feet, and I hope you are successful. Well, I appreciate that, and I know you'll keep holding to me account for doing it. That you can absolutely <laughs> rest assured. Now go and Thanks. sort the parking out for the nurses. Right, I'm on it. Good to see you. Take care. So that's it, my exclusive interview with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on the 100th day of his premiership, or as I put it at the start of the interview, two Liz Trusses already. I don't know what you thought of him, but I felt he was more candid and open in that interview than I've ever seen him before. I also think that he means it when he says he's determined to fix our problems. The big question remains, can he? Well, the clock is ticking to the next election. If he doesn't, the electorate will be unforgiving. But if he does, well, it may not be over yet. That's it from Piers Morgan Uncensored from Downing Street tonight. Remember, wherever you are, even if you're the Prime Minister, Keep it uncensored.